if I wanted to become a software engineer in 2025, these are the exact steps that I would follow. Big tech doesn't want you, bro. Companies pretty much stopped hiring entry-level software engineers. I never thought this would happen. This chart shows the unemployment rates of 25 to 29 year olds with bachelor's degrees. Sadly, computer science is number one. I just got laid off. <laughs> Let's face it, things are brutal. And because of that, you need to know how to actually face this new industry. So this video is gonna outline three major steps that you can take to both gain the skills necessary to become a software engineer and also to land a job. I've even talked to experts in the field that have pretty recent insider information on what companies are actually looking for. A portion of this video has been sponsored by HubSpot. Okay, so step one, industry standard learning. Do not just blindly follow tutorials online. I've seen a ton of people jumpstart their learning by starting to learn online and then doing coding exercises on their own. It is really great to code on your own. In fact, I'd actually recommend practicing alongside any tutorial that you're watching, but that's not enough. Just knowing how to code won't cut it. Knowing how to code in the industry, however, will give you a huge leg up. But what does coding in the industry even mean? Coding in the industry can mean a lot of different things. It's utilizing Azure, AWS, and GCP, basically cloud services, understanding how to use AI as an assisted developer, reading design documents, understanding system design, breaking up your feature into stories, and then also understanding how to communicate with PMs and customers when you're building your product. Again, it's so much more than just coding. As an example, here are a few things that I need to know on the job as an engineer. Let's take a look. The first thing, is using cloud services. I've actually talked about this one in the past and it certainly hasn't changed. When you're learning to code, please start using Azure, AWS, or GCP as a starting point. Because no matter what job you eventually land, you will have to start using one of these. In fact, I use Azure services every single day on the job. It's a pretty vital part of what I do as an engineer. Everything is virtual nowadays. Databases, storage accounts, networking. There's no longer a separation of network engineers, DevOps roles, and full stack engineers. Software engineers do everything now. That's the difference. And now it's easier than ever to create resources and manage them. You just really have a click of the button to do everything. So infrastructure is a must and bonus points if you can set up deployment pipelines because that's also something you'll be using, the CI CD process. The next one is system design. Usually this is reserved for senior engineers, but nowadays junior engineers are expected to know system design. System design is understanding part of what I mentioned before, which are the resources that the API will interact with in the cloud, but it's also understanding the system as a whole or from a bird's eye view. For example, this is what a system design diagram might look like. You're gonna have to know things like how many requests does this application get per day? How many reads, writes, or updates does the, each request make? How available does the app need to be? What does security look like? Should we rely more on horizontal or vertical scaling? Do we need to cache any values? And if you don't know what any of this means, don't worry. I've linked some resources below. So next up is communication. The soft skills always get brushed to the side, but arguably they're more important than those technical skills. You really need to practice communicating with other people that are working on your project. Even something like giving bad news to your manager about not being able to meet a deadline is a really important skill to have because it sets expectations and it also allows other people to understand what to do moving forward. They're not just waiting around for you to deliver something when you've told them that the deadline has moved. This keeps things running smoothly and your manager will thank you for that later. And it doesn't matter if it's not your fault. If an external team can't deliver something on time to you, which delays your own work, you can't just go blaming other people. You have to just let your manager know ASAP that this blocker has occurred. This is a super vital skill to have and a lot of programmers don't know how to take that next step to become a software engineer by having really solid communication skills and understanding how to deal with conflict in the workplace. And the last one is using an AI assistant. Now, this one's maybe more self-explanatory, but at my company, we're required to use AI every single day on the job. To them, you're no longer a productive engineer if you're not using AI as an assisted developer. So this is a really important one. At the very least, I would set up an open AI account and start using ChatGPT right away. It's a free option. Now, ChatGPT is a starting point, but in reality, you want to use something like Copilot eventually, if you can afford it. And there may be some free options online as well, like DeepSeek. But using an in-IDE AI will really skyrocket your productivity. It's like pair programming with another software engineer, only you're technically doing everything yourself. And that being said, if you need examples on how to get started with ChatGPT, I'd actually highly recommend checking out this guide from HubSpot. 
Again, understanding how to use AI, especially in the context of learning how to code, is the easiest way to show that you're an industry-ready developer. You can no longer expect to get hired without these skills. This guide goes over a breakdown of some of the most popular coding languages and their pros and cons, as well as detailed video explanations on how to learn coding using prompting with ChatGPT. It also gives you very specific examples that you can use for prompting. You can literally just copy and paste this into the chat box, actually, as well as comprehensive exercises to help you get started. Started. For example, you've probably heard of a library or a framework, but maybe you haven't used one yet. This is the prompt the guide suggests using to learn more about it. How can I integrate library or framework into my existing programming language project? What are some best practices for doing this? And my favorite section is the building a coding roadmap page. As important as prompting is, it won't matter if you don't have a goal in mind, which you need to slowly work towards every single day. This guide goes on in detail to talk about project-based goals, an example of a structured week of learning and how to track your progress effectively. So it's a good idea to read through the whole thing so you can organize your learning and set incremental wins each week. At the very end, you'll be able to check out a Python teacher GPT created by Sundas Khalid. It's a specialized AI tutor designed to assist learners at various stages of their Python journey. I've linked this HubSpot guide in the description below, so I'd highly recommend checking it out. And it's free. Okay, so that being said, let's move on to step two. The biggest mistake that people make for their interviews is preparing too much for the technical part. Interviewing doesn't really have to be that hard. People get spooked because of those crazy hard leak code questions that get asked in big tech interviews. But in all honesty, you don't even really want to apply to those big tech companies right now. They're not hiring. It's much harder to get in in 2025, and it's also better to just get experience elsewhere before applying for these bigger companies. Now, interviewing does involve coding. Of course it does. But it's so much more than that. Again, coding is just a prerequisite to get the job, but the interview solidifies that you're a software engineer and not just a coder or programmer. These are two completely different things. The soft skills that are more important, it's the, um, you know, for a junior engineer, it's, it's your uh, energy that you're bringing, it's your uh, clarity and communication and things like that have a higher level than the technical skills, but you're maybe fresher out of college and you can maybe remember a little bit more on the uh, technical side, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. At least for specific algorithms and things that they teach in college, less right. on the industry type of things. In the interview, they want you to problem solve through the question. Do not memorize leak code problems. That's actually the first red flag that the interviewer will notice. And I've noticed it too when I've interviewed people. They want to know how to assess your skills while dealing with pressure, not knowing the answer and still working through the problem step by step, and also being able to communicate honestly when you're blocked. Here's a pro tip. Treat the interview like a pair programming session, only you're leading that pair programming session. And the interviewer is more like a customer or a PM. You can ask some questions like what out puts are you looking for? How many requests and responses can I expect? And then use them as a sounding board to bounce questions and ideas back and forth with. Spend 15 minutes talking through the problem, ask questions, clarify your thought process, then spend 15 minutes writing out pseudocode or just like hashing out your ideas step by step. Just give your ideas more clarity and write them down. The last 10 minutes are when you actually code. Yes, you heard that right. If you plan things well, that's really all you'll need. The coding part should be the easy part. And if not, you're not doing things correctly. So the most important way to prepare and be confident in this sort of process is to just do a ton of mock interviews. That's really the only way. Even if you do hundreds of leak code questions, it won't prepare you for the collaborative nature of the interview. And don't forget to practice on a non-compilable Google Doc with a friend, because in the real interview, you may not have an IDE that you can use to compile your code. In fact, I actually did this with my friend as well when I was studying to get into Microsoft. You also want to have a solid understanding of all the things that I mentioned in part one for the interviews. The coding, system design, AI-assisted development, cloud services, etc. Really have a grasp of these things because they will ask you about it in the interview if you've mentioned it on your resume. Do not, and I repeat, do not apply for the job two days later, three days later, or even a week after the job has been posted. Apply the day of, or consider that the role's already been taken. Apply early um, on requisitions. I'd say that's very helpful. Um, I would set up alerts on the Microsoft Careers page for any specific roles or technology that you have experience in. Set up alerts daily so that you as soon as those roles open, you can apply. Because with 
our, our applicant volumes are, are high. Okay. Uh, and we only keep roles open for a certain amount of time. You know, it could be depending on the role, if we're expecting to get 2000 applicants, we may only keep it open, scheduled open for seven days. So if you set them up for weekly, you may not catch that or, or something mm -hmm. like that. As Jeff mentioned, recruiters get so many applications every single day. It's almost impossible to look at these applications on a rolling basis, even if they come in a few days later. So just keep that in mind. And this is probably the case with most mid-sized to big companies. Have alerts set up so as soon as a job gets posted, you'll be notified and you can send in your application almost immediately. And I know this is not always realistic. People are busy. They have class or work. They have other obligations. But try to at least apply within the 24-hour mark of the job being posted. Posted. That'll really increase your chances a lot. And definitely try hard to find people at those companies to connect with. So a lot of people make the mistake of actually going to LinkedIn and reaching out to recruiters at the company. But if you think about it, those recruiters are getting so many messages from other applicants. So I would actually go straight to junior engineers or hiring managers. Again, hiring managers may be the same thing as recruiters where they're getting messages as well, but a junior engineer won't be getting messages to set up a coffee chat just to learn about their role or the company. They'll jump at that opportunity. And basically that opens up the door for you to get other connections from that junior engineer, maybe a senior engineer, maybe a hiring manager. So that's your gateway into the company. This could be pivotal for your chances of getting a job, even more so than just a referral. And then for your resume, don't forget to cater your resume to the job requirements as well. You guys have probably all heard about the ATS system and I've talked about it on this channel before. Well, there are websites out there that will help score your resume and give you an understanding of where you fall on that ATS system based on the job description. Here are a few examples of resumes that I've liked in the past. And here's my resume that I'm using right now. And no, it's not perfect, but I have at least put an effort into making sure that the keywords are there. If you look, you can see my tech stack. You can see all the things that I've worked with, my communication skills, the leadership, but most importantly, it is that tech stack that the ATS will be looking for. So that's pretty much it. Those are my three steps for helping you increase your odds of becoming a software engineer and landing a job. The industry has changed a lot even in the past couple of years. So these steps have been updated accordingly. And if you wanna connect with other like-minded people, feel free to check out my Discord where we have sessions every other Friday and talk about all things tech and even have a little fun over there too. So check it out. See ya.